Okay, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Wei Fen, a PhD student in the civil engineering department. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about the competitiveness of Im electric commercial vehicles in terms of fleet replacement. And, uh, and then study the economic and technological factors that affect the competitiveness of electric trucks. Uh, so first, as we know, the electric trucks has some advantages less, like clean energy, less pollution, less noise, and low maintenance cost. Uh, but it also has some disadvantage, like higher capital cost and, uh, and uh, range anxiety, like uh, be because of the battery capacity. Uh, so in terms of the private companies, uh, fleet owners, they are interested in uh, some strategies to minimize their total cost in the future. So we want to study, uh, so I'm going to uh, give you a brief introduction about the fleet replacement. So in fleet re replacement problem, there are two trade-offs. One is as vehicles are getting old, they, the, the, they tend to cost more to operate and maintenance. And uh, if, you, if the fleet manager wants to replace with new vehicles, it costs less, but uh, to operate and maintenance, but it involves high capital cost. So there is an optimal replacement age. Uh, uh, and uh, another uh, trade-off is there are a lot of uh, vehicle tech, uh, technologies in the market and different manufacturers, so they have different price, salvage revenue, and operating and maintenance cost functions. So uh, there will be an optimal uh, choice for the fleet owners to choose to replace their existing fleet. So there are two optimalities, and, uh, but uh, the market uncertainty and the variability in the, uh, op uh, in the vehicular characteristics makes the optimalities change, uh, varies. So sensitivity is analysis. Uh, sensitivity analysis is important to study how the uncertainty and uh, variabilities affect the competitiveness of electric commercial vehicles. So the objective of this research is there are two. So first, we want to uh, uh, formulate and implement an optimization framework to help fleet owners to uh, optimize their fleet replacement decisions and uh, uh, provide them sensitivity and uh, analysis results. And uh, the second one is uh, by sensitivity analysis, we want to study how the economic uh, factors and uh, vehicular characteristics affect the competitiveness of electric commercial vehicles. So the methodology, is, so the framework has three parts, inputs, model, and outputs. So the objective function of the model here uh, is to uh, minimize the net cost sum, uh, the sum of the net cost of five cost components over the whole uh, planning horizon, like for example, 30 years in the future. And these cost components include purchase cost, energy cost, operating and maintenance cost, emissions cost, and uh, salvage revenue, which is the negative cost. And uh, in the inputs part, there are three parts. Uh, first is uh, economic factors, like the planning horizon, discount rate, fuel and the electricity price forecast, and uh, annual utilization, which means miles traveled per year, per, per truck. And uh, some vehicular characteristics and the uh, initial fleet composition. This means uh, the number and type of vehicles the fleet owners want to optimize their existing fleet composition. After uh, the fleet owner specify all the input uh, information and sort them into the model, and it will run itself and uh, give the results uh, in terms of replacement plan, optimal replacement plan, and, uh, and some other performance measures like cost breakdown, uh, fuel consumption, greenhouse gas emissions, and uh, vehicle age and penetration, sensitivity plots, and the break-even values that I will talk about uh, later in this presentation. So uh, we proposed a baseline scenario. So we tested uh, two types of vehicles. So we use Isuzu N-Series to represent the di conventional diesel truck, and the Navistar E-Star to represent the electric truck. And uh, all the black color values are we got from the reference as an uh, average value. Uh, uh, and uh, the red color values are what we assumed as a hypothetical fleet owner. 
uh, they plan to minimize their cost over a 30 years time horizon and uh, annually uh, their annual demand is 30 vehicles and uh, the initial fleet composition we just uh, assume they have 30 vehicle uh, Isuzu vehicles at the beginning and uh, two units for each eight evenly distributed then uh, we propose some other scenarios because the utilization and the uh, commercial, uh, a conventional diesel truck has different uh, fuel economies in different companies because they operate in different routes and different characteristics. So we propose six scenarios with low, medium, and high utilization uh, and uh, high and low uh, conventional diesel truck fuel economies. Uh, so here are the results. Uh, I skipped the detailed op op uh, replacement plan, but I show some performance measures. So here is the average fleet penetration, which means uh, how much uh, diesel and electric trucks has been used uh, throughout the uh, time horizon 30 years, for example. As you can see, in scenario zero, 0 and 1, most of the time, the optimal solution is to keep using the diesel trucks. And in scenario 4 and 5, electric trucks are dominant. Uh, so this is the average over throughout the horizon. And we also want to know uh, what's the initial fleet penetration uh, based on the optimal solution. So because uh, this is for the whole 30 years, and it might happen, uh, it may change, situation may change in the future. So uh, the fleet owners want to know at present time uh, whether it is uh, optimal to replace their current uh, diesel truck with electric trucks. And the results show that in the first th uh, four scenarios, uh, the, uh, in the current year, always keep using the diesel trucks. And uh, in the other four, uh, in scenario four and five, 13% uh, of the existing fleet uh, is better to be replaced by electric trucks at the present time. So, so basically, scenario four and five favors uh, electric trucks. And here are the relationship between average, optimal average replacement age and the scenarios. As you can see, in most of the scenarios, uh, uh, actually all the scenarios, the electric trucks has a longer uh, average repl replacement cycle than the diesel trucks. And the cost breakdown shows that in most of the scenarios, capital cost is uh, dominant. Occup uh, it shares the most uh, a proportion of the total cost, followed by operating maintenance cost and fuel cost. And uh, emissions cost and uh, salvage revenue uh, shares a very little percentage of the total cost. So here is another interesting uh, sensitivity analysis uh, w uh, break, called break-even values. What this means is that, for, for example, the diesel MPG, so for each of the input parameters, if they are larger or equal than, or smaller or equal than, some equal to some value, the electric trucks will be dominant, uh, will, will be preferable. preferable. Uh, for example, if the electric truck price is smaller or equal to $126,000 in scenario one, then electric trucks will be uh, uh, dominant. Uh, dominant in the throughout the uh, 30 years time horizon. And in scenario four and five, uh, the electric trucks already dominant. So summary, uh, so the question whether electric commercial vehicles is uh, competitive to the conventional diesel truck, uh, the answer is it really depends. Depends on different situations, uh, different input uh, variables combinations. And we have, through uh, the sensitivity analysis, we found some general findings here. Like electric trucks are more favorable in median and high utilization with low conventional diesel truck fuel economy scenarios. And uh, within the realistic range of high uh, fuel price and uh, government incentive, like uh, 15 to 20 percent of the purchase price reduction. Uh, the electric trucks can be uh, can win the uh, can beat the diesel trucks. 
also the changes in other input variables uh, within the tested range uh, cannot affect the competitiveness of electric trucks uh, individually. For each of them, they uh, change them, cannot change, uh, change the results. But when they are combined, uh, it, they, they might affect the results. But there are too many combinations uh, that we cannot test all of them scenarios. Uh, so the recommendation is uh, if the fleet, uh, fleet owners want to use this model, uh, they, uh, they'd better to estimate their fleet uh, cost every year and uh, update their input and run the model annually to get the results because the market uh, variables are changing and the vehicle characteristics are also changing. Uh, so with that, I want to thank OTRAC for supporting us and uh, my colleague Brian Davis, which will pre present later, providing the valuable comments. And uh, here are some data assumptions and source. So I would like to take uh, all of your questions. Thank you. Oh, yes? Um, you mentioned that the longevity of electric vehicles. Oh. You mentioned that uh, the longevity of electric vehicles were uh, quite a bit higher, um, mm -hmm. but the salvage value was, was substantially smaller. Um, does that signal that companies or jurisdictions will be holding onto the vehicles longer and I guess uh, I guess indicate a paradigm shift on how we replace vehicles? We would keep electric vehicles for longer rather than replace them. Or does that mean that when these vehicles are put back out into market, um, that all of a sudden there would be a very large used electric vehicle market that could have uh, subsequently uh, affect the value um, or retail value of those used cars? So let me repeat your question. Why the, so you are asking why the uh, electric trucks has longer replacement cycle, right? Right. I guess yeah. if the, the electric vehicles last longer, would you uh, oh, I guess long. suggest that um, these these companies, I guess, don't replace vehicles quite as often? Uh, uh, th uh, yeah, that's from the conceptual side. Uh, from the model results, uh, I can explain why uh, the electric trucks last longer because they have relatively uh, high capital cost. So, uh, it's it's, and uh, so the, salvage, the same uh, salvage depreciation rate applies to both vehicles. Uh, the uh, electric truck vehicles lose values, uh, lo lose uh, cost, uh, lo lose the salvage value uh, much bigger than the conventional diesel truck. So the model uh, results will be <coughs> using the, uh, will be replacing the electric vehicles longer than the diesel trucks. Uh, from the conceptual uh, side, uh, uh, basically, I, I just uh, reporting the results from the model. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, Kurt. Um, I, so the base, yeah, the basic uh, comparison is price uh, for the diesel versus yeah, electric. the total cost. Yeah. Um, I also noticed, I think it was in slide six, it pointed out the uh, CO two emissions. Yeah. And I was curious. Um, one was uh, were, were the CO two emissions um, considered as far as mm -hmm. uh, uh, what would be preferable? And the other thing is, I noticed that you uh, assumed that zero emissions were given off by electric vehicles, uh, but mm. um, the yeah. electricity has got to come from somewhere. Yeah. So yeah, that's a I was great just question. Curious yeah. what you uh, how you use that as far as your analysis? Yeah, uh, to run the model, we obtain some uh, input variable to keep it simple. And uh, we, we uh, for uh, the emissions, we only consider the pipe, uh, tailpipe emissions. So we assume electric vehicles do not have any emissions. Uh, we, we didn't consider the generation of electricity, that kind of emissions. And uh, uh, so, yeah, that's uh, the emissions we have considered in this model. Uh, in the future, maybe we can consider the uh, emissions for generating the electricity and also the vehicle's production emissions and uh, some other emissions. Uh, so the, the prim uh, as I uh, showed here, the emissions, if we add a penalty cost to it, it really occupies a, a share of a very small proportion of the total cost. So it really doesn't matter if we include those production emissions or not. So, yeah. Okay. Yes? Yeah, please. Uh, the mic. Um, you talked about, you talked about um, how some of the barriers are, or one of the barriers is range anxiety. Um, mm -hmm. Did you look at the cost or um, obstacles to 
um, developing the charging infrastructure for these types of fleets? Uh, not in this study, uh, but there are, there are researchers, uh, uh, how to say, uh, researchers claim about the range anxiety and the charging uh, operations, how to make uh, establish the charging stations. Uh, but uh, I didn't study them in this study, but it's good to look at them in the future res uh, research. Yes, thank you for the advice. Yeah. Oh, uh, I think. Uh, oh, Dr. Filiozzi, you can give. So for oh. the um, electric car, car um, what I know is up to 40 miles per hour, they can operate electrically, but after that, they have to operate with uh, like fuel. So. What with you analyze, is that based on that, or you assume they operate electrically whatever speed they have? Uh, these are elect uh, pure electrical trucks, so not, uh, I think you, you are uh, mentioning is uh, hybrid trucks, so they can use fuel and electricity, but these vehicles, they can only use electricity. Okay. Um, we're running out of time, so oh, sorry, for the sorry. sake of completing the, you know, giving enough time to the other speakers, we have to stop it here. Sorry. Brian is going to talk more about electric vehicles, so you can save your question for him, especially if it's very difficult. Mm Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Suresha Kuturi, and uh, I'm a graduate student uh, working on my PhD in civil engineering. And uh, today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, some of the work that we've been doing uh, with the city of Portland uh, to automatically collect uh, multimodal performance measures at signalized intersections. Um, so the objective of our study was to use the existing infrastructure, both in terms of hardware and software, uh, to develop a long-term uh, data collection system which would effectively allow us to monitor uh, bicycle and pedestrian activity. And uh, this has become uh, critically important in the last decade because we have seen uh, tremendous increases in the active modes of transportation, uh, such as biking and walking. Um, however, the data pertaining to these modes is still very sparse. There's a huge gap. And so without good data, on usage and demand, we cannot make the case for new improvements. We cannot estimate the benefits of the improvements already made. And we also cannot plan for future facilities. Um, so uh, this is the study area. Uh, when we uh, wrote this paper, we were getting uh, bicycle counts from about uh, three uh, locations or intersections. And right now, we're up to 10, and they're continuously being added. Uh, pedestrian actuations and delay, we are uh, collecting it uh, from eight intersections on 82nd Avenue. Um, this corridor was primarily chosen because it has high levels of pedestrian activity. Um, we have newer um, infrastructure, the new 2070 controllers on this corridor. And we also have uh, pedestrian push buttons on the cross streets, which allow us to gather some of the data. And uh, recently, we've also implemented um, internal logic to uh, get bicycle delay at one intersection. Um, so in um, some intersections uh, in the city, uh, you often find two loops in the bike lane. So the first loop uh, is the stop bar loop. And it is, uh, as the name suggests, close to the stop bar. And is typically used for uh, detection and phase changes. Um, so it's often connected in series with these other vehicle loops. So we cannot get accurate bicycle counts out of it. 
Um, the second loop is the advanced loop, and it is about 40 to 60 feet from the stop bar. Um, this is typically used for yellow extensions. Uh, and in this study, we have repurposed this loop. So we are, in addition to using it for detection, uh, we are also using it uh, to gather counts. Uh, we have uh, studied, uh, or so the four conditions need to be met in order to um, gather these counts. Uh, first off, we need uh, presence of an exclusive bicycle lane. Uh, secondly, we need uh, the advanced loop in the bicycle lane. Uh, we also need that the loop is connected by itself and not uh, with in series with any of the other vehicle detectors. And finally, we need um, communication to the signal controller, which allows us to retrieve these counts. Um, so bicycle counts are important because they allow us to study uh, statistics about uh, usage and demand, and also uh, we can study different trends. Uh, but in order to uh, do that, first we need to verify how accurate these counts are. So uh, we performed an experiment, and we collected some vi video data. Um, this is at the intersection of uh, Winning and Wheeler, so right by the Rose Quarter. Um, it's a heavy bicycle commuter route. Um, and we compared these uh, video counts to the loop counts. And for both the inbound and outbound bicycle um, counts, we found a similar trend that the um, loops are underestimating uh, the volumes. Uh, and we think that this could be attributed to two reasons. One, um, not every cyclist will ride over the loop, especially if they want to make a turning maneuver further downstream at the intersection. And uh, secondly, uh, it could also be related to the sensitivity setting, which is a parameter that you can change. Uh, so if you turn it up, you can uh, potentially uh, detect more bikes, but you can also maybe detect cars. So. Um, we also looked at different uh, usage trends. Um, these two uh, charts here show the inbound and outbound bicycle counts. Uh, the uh, lines in red are uh, the counts we obtained during uh, summer and spring months, so uh, warm months in the year. And the blue lines are uh, those that are obtained in the uh, winter and fall. So we see an expected trend. Ridership is much higher in the warmer months. Uh, the magnitudes range from 60% uh, in the inbound direction to 76% uh, difference in the outbound direction. And we also see that um, this location has more riders um, going uh, in the outbound direction. So maybe their um, Williams is close by North Williams. So I think they're connecting to that. Um, moving on to the pedestrian side, um, for demand, there are a number of models that have been uh, developed looking at uh, land use and socioeconomic characteristics. Um, other researchers have also looked at phase actuations as a proxy for demand. Um, delay is important characteristic because typically used in uh, level of service calculations to assess how well the system is doing. Um, it also that higher values are important because um, these can lead to non-compliance, which in turn can have uh, negative safety implications. Um, the highway capacity manual also gives us an equation to estimate delay, but uh, uh, other research has shown that this delay is not very accurate when compared to the um, actual or true delay. And then we asked, why do we need to model when we can measure it? Um, so and along major arterial corridors such as uh, Powell Boulevard or 82nd Avenue, uh, the city implements both vehicle and pedestrian recall on the mainline faces. Um, so for example, this is the intersection of 82nd and Tillamook. And so phases 2 and 6, which represent the south and northbound movements on 82nd Avenue, will come up every cycle, irrespective of demand. So in this study, we are collecting delay only for those phases that are not on recall, so for phases 4 and 8. So the PED phases are crossing 82nd Avenue. So it's the north and south crosswalks on 82nd Avenue. Um, we are using uh, the existing hardware, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the 2070 controllers, the pedestrian push buttons, 
And uh, we also use Voyage, which is the uh, signal controller software, and we program um, internal logic commands to collect this delay. Um, and we've uh, come up with two new methods to collect this delay. The first one is called uh, transit priority logging. So one of the advanced features in Voyage software is the ability to record um, an event every time a bus requests transit priority. So we are using this feature, and we fake a pedestrian call as a transit priority call. So uh, when so we essentially record the time when the pedestrian pushes the push button and the time when the walk is served. And so the difference between these two times gives us delay. Uh, in the second um, method, the volume bin logging, we make use of timers in the internal logic, and we classify the delay into different bins. Uh, the number is, again, user-defined. We've defined three bins in the study, 0 to 20, 20 to 40, and greater than 40. And uh, the number of bins, again, depends on the number of lines of internal code that's available. Um, so both these methods give us uh, the number of actuations and delay. And studying the actuations gives us uh, an indication of the level of activity, the pedestrian activity at an intersection. Um, so this plot here shows um, the actuations for one day across various intersections. Um, and we can see that for Division, Flavel, and Holgate, the um, actuations are significantly higher compared to the other intersections. And we think this is, could be related to the land use um, surrounding these intersections. Um, we can also study uh, weekday versus weekend trends. Uh, so this plot here sh is for 82nd and Division, shows the actuations over one week. We see that Monday through Thursday, um, the actuations are very similar, and um, then they tend to drop off on Friday, uh, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, we can also look at hourly actuations. Um, this is, again, for 82nd and Division. So phase 4 and 8 are the north and south crosswalks. We see that the pedestrian actuation activity is highest during midday. And um, so this can uh, ha this sort of information can help us uh, maybe refine our signal timing plan so we may we can try and give more priority to towards pedestrians possibly during the midday in the non peak hours when there is lower volume of vehicles um, and finally, moving on to delay, uh, we can get average delays from the transit priority logging. And from the volume bins, we get uh, a maximum and a minimum range for delay. And um, these delays can be used to calculate the level of service at an intersection. And you can also use it for um, signal retiming. So uh, are we exceeding a certain threshold of delay? If yes, then maybe we should consider retiming. Uh, we can also try and change permissive length. Permissive length is uh, the time within a cycle during which if a call comes in, uh, the call can get served in the same cycle. So technically, if you increase the permissive length, you can reduce delay. And finally, we can reevaluate our co coordination plans. Do we need to stay coordinated 24-7, or can we uh, pull signals out of coordination and thereby give ourselves greater flexibility uh, to reduce uh, pedestrian delay? Um, so finally, in summary, uh, there is a growing need for bike and pet data, both for uh, planning as well as operational purposes. Um, in this study, we have uh, started to gather bicycle counts from existing uh, loop detectors. This is a cost-effective technology, but uh, we, uh, there are certain considerations. Uh, loop sensitivity, calibration, and placement all can have a bearing on accuracy. And finally, we may not be able to capture all bicycles. Um, Pedestrian performance measures, we are capturing the number of actuations and delay, but we have no way uh, to capture the number of pedestrians. So we don't know if there is one person crossing or 10 people <coughs> crossing. Um, and one of the limitations in this study is that these methods are specific to the hardware and software that uh, we use here, but we think that they can easily be extended, um, and similar methods can be, can be developed at other places. 
Um, in the future, we want to look at uh, and study in detail the factors that are affecting pedestrian delay. Also want to look at uh, and analyze uh, bicycle delay. And finally, when we get all these pieces <coughs> of the puzzle, we want to look at uh, an intersection um, and, uh, and optimize it considering the needs of all users and just not uh, vehicles alone. Um, I'd like to acknowledge USDOT and OTREC for uh, supporting this project. My co-authors in the study, Dr. Monsier, Ty, and Peter, and uh, Nelson, Mark, and Paul from the city of Portland uh, who helped us collect this data. And uh, that's my contact information, our TRB paper number, and be happy to take your questions. Uh, my question is, uh, did you consider the match pairs if, the, for example, a bike, bicycle stop in the loop, what happened? Because it counts uh, many times, right? Yeah, so that's why we don't uh, use the stop bar loops for getting counts. We want to try and count bicycles when they're in motion. So that's why we take counts from the advance. Okay, and another question is, uh, what's the effect of uh, rain or even snow and uh, sensitivity of the device? Um, they are um, embedded in the pavement, so um, I, I don't have proof, but I think that uh, it shouldn't affect it. And here it rains almost nine months a year, and we still get down. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So I, I don't think that that should affect. How about the it. snow? Um, yeah, I, I, I haven't seen anything that says that the, uh, there is an effect. Thanks. I'm not sure if you covered this in the crosswalks that are on 82nd Avenue, but I was curious whether crosswalk signaling that have countdowns, whether that had any effect on the delay if, if, if pedestrians were more likely to, to try and make a light because there's a pedestrian countdown or wait longer so there was longer delay um, um, when they're at their crossing. Yeah, since uh, we didn't have video detection at these locations, we really couldn't study that, um, the trend that you're talking about, so we don't know. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about what you have determined about video detection. Is, would that be cost prohibitive or would there be privacy issues or would that be a possibility to do the pedestrian studies using video? Um, I think there are places that have done video detection, but you need uh, specific algorithms and software um, and communication set up to do that. So. Uh, expense would certainly come in there, but um, here we were just trying to use what we have currently. So, yeah. Uh, about the pedestrian light, is there a way to change the settings based on the number of pedestrians who push the button? No. <laughs> no. More on the pedestrians, was it counted every time the button was pushed, or was it just one per cycle? One per cycle. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sincerest apologies. I'm going to switch us away from the bike and pedestrian considerations back into the dry realm of freight logistics. Um, there it is. And I'm actually, as Dr. Figliozzi alluded to, going to talk about a fairly similar topic to what Way presented. Um, the difference being Way used a vehicle replacement model, which is a lot more of an application, whereas I'm looking at it from more of a theoretical point of view. I want to identify situations where the theoretical fleet manager that Way modeled will like electric vehicles more. Um, 
So a quick outline, I'm going to discuss a little bit of background on electric trucks and then we'll segue into the methodology which combines three fairly distinct models into one sort of overarching framework. And from there we can look at several different scenarios and try and identify conditions that have to exist for electric trucks to do well in, in a brass tax cost perspective sense. Uh, then I'll present a break-even analysis. We'll look at what fuel prices should be, what inflation should be for the electric truck and the conventional truck to perform equally well over a 10-year time horizon, and finally end with some concluding thoughts. So a little bit of background. Electric vehicles, you've probably seen the commercials. You might have walked down Electric Avenue. Uh, the political climate and the economic climate is very conducive to EVs now. They've been around for a long time. They haven't really had any good market penetration yet. Is this current rollout going to be any different? Well, that's what we're going to try and find some insight into. I think after Wei's presentation, we had a question about batteries. Previously, you had batteries that when they hit a certain speed, you had to have assistance from a gasoline motor to continue to propel it faster and faster. There used to be a trade-off between how much energy a battery could store and how quickly it could deliver it. Well, at least some of that has been negated by some funds from the federal stimulus package from 2009. Uh, there were DO DOE grants, I'm sorry, that went into the development of a new generation of batteries. And while they're far from perfect, as we're going to talk about, they are a little bit better. And today's trucks can actually get to 50 or even 55 miles per hour empty on just the battery power alone, which is pretty good for most urban situations. Um, and this is a pretty new technology. The first electric trucks entered the marketplace in 2009, and over the last two years have really started to get more and more penetration with companies like Frito-Lay, Federal Express, Staples, rolling out electric delivery trucks in, among other places, Portland. So here are the characteristics of three trucks that I'm looking at in this research, and there are a few things to point out here. One disadvantage that electric trucks have to overcome in order to be competitive is that far more of their total weight is devoted to just the basic truck. Uh, does anyone have any good ideas as to why that might be? Battery. Absolutely. The battery is really heavy. It's just not as efficient from an energy per pound point of view as diesel fuel, and it probably never will be, certainly not in the near future. So it's gotta, the electric truck has got to be able to compensate in other ways for that shortcoming. And the other thing is the price of electric trucks is significantly more, about three times as much as for an Isuzu N-Series, which is a very common conventional truck. And that, of course, is due to the battery. The battery is um, it, as much as three quarters of that $150,000 initial purchase cost. Uh, so the research goals, we want to know what is the best truck. If you tell me a given scenario, we want to identify what the best truck is out of those three that I talked about. Um, what effects do, do the various route constraints have on which truck is the best and what the costs are? So by routing constraints, I mean how much weight does each customer want? How are they distributed throughout the city? And in what situations are they competitive? In other words, what will fuel prices have to be? What will inflation have to be? Um, in order to do that, we look at it from a few different ang angles. And first, it's useful to sort of formulate a cost minimization model. So we have an objective function that's just telling me what I want to do. And my goal is to minimize the total cost, total cost being the sum of each individual cost. Um, I have to consider certain constraints in doing that. The energy that I spend on the route can't be more than I have available. The capacity, I can't put more stuff in the truck than it can hold. And finally, there is a time constraint. Drivers can't drive more than a certain amount of time in a day due to physical limitations, sometimes legal limitations, and that sort of thing. Um, my decision variable, the way I'm going to minimize costs, is really simple. I'm going to choose the number of trucks that makes the cost 
the least while at the same time adhering to all the constraints. So from that point of view, it's a fairly simple model. There are many models out there that have hundreds or even thousands of decision variables. I have one. That makes life easy. And um, so I skipped ahead. So a little bit about the cost. The purchase costs and the tax incentives are fairly straightforward. I could look those up. The battery replacement costs is a lot trickier because there's not an agreement in the literature. Some of the literature says the battery is going to last longer than the vehicle. Other literature says it's not going to last for the lifetime of the vehicle, but th the cost is going to come down by the time you have to replace it. Or maybe the cost won't come down at all. So we're going to have to look at a few different angles there. The maintenance cost, I can get a good number because we have experience now with electric vehicles for the per mile maintenance cost. So I do need to know how many miles I'm going to drive the truck in order to come up with that. And the energy cost, I also need to know my utilization. I also need to know how much energy the truck is going to use per mile. So those are the two things I need to think about next, the utilization and the energy consumption. Uh, so utilization, we consider something called the vehicle routing problem. It's a good name. It describes it well. It asks the question, if I have to serve a certain body of customers, what is the best way, what is the distance I have to travel in order to do that? Every time you do a sort of Google map search, Google solves a vehicle routing problem for you, essentially. Um, it's a famously difficult problem to solve as the number of customers increases beyond just very small values. So what we do is approximate it by using a function that just states what the distance to be traveled is in terms of the customer density and how they're distributed, how many there are, and it's good for high-level planning approaches. Uh, so the energy consumption, there are three ways in which a truck consumes energy. If you think about it, it's fairly simple. They consume energy accelerating. They consume energy overcoming the resistances that they encounter, namely aerodynamic resistance and rolling resistance, the internal friction of the engine and the, uh, the, the way trucks push down and deflate the tires rather than using all their energy to propel forward. Um, and that's described by just basic physics 101 equations. And it turns out that that's, a fact, that that's a function of travel speed, the distance traveled, and the weight of the truck. So from the logistics model that I just described, we can come up with good values for these. And we can start to look at some of the scenarios. So we look at 128 different scenarios. The, keen power of two minds out there will realize that's two to the seventh and I'd vary seven different parameters between a low value that makes sense and a high value that makes sense and come up with these various scenarios. So one example, if I have a sparse customer base that's far from a depot, fairly low demand weight and fairly high gas prices, in that scenario we have those three values for the lifetime cost for each truck. So in that scenario, the Navistar would kind of be declared a winner. It serves the it serves that particular route uh, with the least lifetime cost. Different scenario if I have a dense customer base that's far from the depot, a higher demand weight and expensive gas. In that scenario, the the Smith Newton is going to be a little bit better. And if you remember from the slide where I showed the specifications, the Smith had a higher tear weight, so it uses more energy. However, for high demand weights, it's a little bit more of an efficient vehicle. And another scenario, if I have a dense customer base that's now close to the depot, demand weight's low and the gas is cheap. In that scenario, the Suzu conventional truck is going to be the best. And so one theme that we're already starting to see here, the 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 two scenarios I described out of these three where the electric trucks are better, the distance traveled is farther. And th the initial cost is very high, but the energy cost, the per mileage cost, the maintenance costs are much lower for the electric trucks. So the theme that emerges is we have to have situations where 
the running costs over the lifetime of the truck overwhelm the fact that the purchase cost is three times as high for the electric truck to be successful. Um, so you can see here that depending on what assumptions I make, the number of scenarios in which the electric truck wins can vary pretty greatly. Uh, and pretty much all of them, at least at the present moment, the conventional truck is going to be the best bet, though. Uh, in fact, the, the best the electric trucks do is win in 37 out of the 128 scenarios, and that's assuming that there's no battery replacement, uh, which is kind of, you can assume that, and you can defend it with literature, but there's also a lot of literature that says that you might need a battery replacement. Um, another way to attack it is to look at, as I mentioned, what the fuel prices need to be for the electric truck and the conventional truck to have the same lifetime costs. Um, so the way I do that is I just select values for all of my parameters and keep them the same and vary one. And then I have the total e-truck costs equal to the total conventional truck costs. And so for here, if I have a sparse customer base with a low demand weight, and I assume I have to replace the battery, in that scenario, the Isuzu miles per gallon would have to be equal to about five and a third, or the purchase cost would have to come down to nearly $100,000, so about 30%, um, or the diesel price would have to rise to 634 a gallon, or the fuel, the, the year over year inflation rate of uh, gasoline and energy would have to be about 12.6%. So different scenario, assuming I have no battery replacement, a dense customer base that's far from the depot, and a high demand weight. Um, again, the, the high demand weights are far more favorable to the Smith, which is higher payload than the Navistar. So you can see that the, uh, the Navistar numbers there are really unrealistic. It's hard to envision a scenario where a, a conventional truck only gets three and a half miles to the gallon or where diesel prices, you know, barring World War III, rise to 932. Um, whereas with the Smith, not a lot has to happen. They're pretty competitive in that scenario already. Uh, so finally, the, we, we presented the first model here that looks at the costs of electric vehicles, including a logistics model and an energy consumption model. And we can easily adapt this to, I looked at three trucks here, two, convention, or two electricals and one conventional truck. It's easily adaptable as new technology comes or if, again, Way's theoretical fleet manager wants to make a decision between, say, an international box truck and a bolder electric vehicle, which has recently hit the marketplace. Um, and the next step is to determine what the environmental impacts are. That's kind of the fun part about electric vehicles is they eliminate tailpipe emissions and wells to wheels. They may or may not reduce emissions significantly. That's the paper I'm working on next. Uh, so just to summarize, electric trucks are competitive if the daily distance is high, so you can have some of that, that cost of the, the initial purchase recuperated. Uh, if customer stops are very frequent, electric trucks don't idle. Um, they don't require any energy to start, so you're saving some energy there. Uh, if they're loaded to a high percentage of their capacity, that's a good thing because you're not buying as many trucks. Really having to buy all those extra trucks at three times the cost is what hurts an electric vehicle's competitiveness. Um, if grades or anything else exists where the energy expanded is increased, again, that, that theme, the energy that's increased, or the energy that's spent is sort of recuperating slowly over time that investment in the initial purchase cost by running a more efficient vehicle that uses a cheaper form of fuel. And obviously, if the planning horizon is extended beyond the 10 years that we assume in this research, then you have more time for that initial purchase cost to be recuperated and more chance of the electric vehicle winning. So uh, big hugs to the PSU faculty enhancement grant, OTREC, who is, I guess, now like the rich uncle I never had, and the US Department of Transportation for generously paying my tuition this year. So uh, with that, questions? Lots of them. Uh, yes? 
did you um, look at all at the uh, issue of installing the charging equipment? The um, the charging equipment is kind of a neat a neat beast because the in order to charge one of these from zero to full actually takes eight hours. So the scenario I looked at assumes that a driver comes in in the morning, drives his route, and then returns to the depot, charges the truck overnight. Now there are ways that are emerging kind of slowly over time, and that's why this is a lot of fun, is the technology, literally every few days I see a new article on a new development. Well now you have situations where you could charge the thing at, in 15 or 30 minutes, to a very high percentage of its capacity However, you do that at a huge penalty to the charging efficiency. Charging efficiencies, if you slow charge, are over 80%, and they drop to 10 or 15% if you charge more quickly. So that's sort of one of those topics for future work. And actually, Dr. Figliozzi has co-authored a paper with um, another PSU alumnus, Ryan Conrad, that looks at that and um, you know, asks the question about how does how do charging locations influence the range and the cost and that sort of thing? Well, if I don't mind my asking, what is charging efficiency? Charging efficiency is the, so if I spent, if I have an 80% charging efficiency and I put 100 kilowatt hours into the battery, or I'm sorry, if I put 80 kilowatt hours into the battery at an 80% efficiency, I'll actually have to pay for 100% or for 100 kilowatt hours from my electric company. So oh, I see. So it has just to do with how much the electric electric company charges you. Well, less that, yeah. and how much how much of the electricity that comes from the power plant actually gets delivered into the battery during the charging process. Okay. Some of it's lost. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Are you? Oh, I want to just know if you considered looking at the options of using like um, natural gas powered vehicles as opposed to just conventional diesel, or if that was. That's um, yeah. There's that's one of the fascinating things to me. There's a big movement now away from diesel for all of the environmental and political reasons that uh, are fairly obvious. And which one or ones will emerge as the alternative? Is electricity has some infrastructure already because we all have electrical power in our homes and our offices and our warehouses. Um, now, natural gas, there are a lot of people that think natural gas is going to be a great alternative. And in fact, there's a Freightliner has, I think, a, a line of natural gas trucks out. There are definitely benefits to be realized from that, but. Uh, I personally have not looked at that. I don't know very much about it, although that would be a really interesting topic for future references to uh, propane trucks are also something that's being considered. It would be really interesting to compare all of the power, uh, electricity, diesel, LNG, CNG, propane, and see if a clear winner emerges. But I think to some extent the free market is, is going to determine that because these all require an infrastructure, no matter what fuel you use. And right now, it seems like electricity is winning, although there's propane available at gas stations. Forklifts run on it. Uh, there's some LNG infrastructure that's created. So kind of ask me that again in 10 years, and I'll have a better answer for you. Yes, ma'am. Um, I was just wondering what your energy cost variable looked like in the model, if it accounted for, you know, as EVs become more popular, possibly skyrocketing prices compared to what's now, I guess, relatively cheaper to run an EV than diesel. No, that's um, that's a really good question. I, I don't know. That's a great question. I have no idea what electricity will do. What we did assume is that energy will go up year over year at the same rate regardless of where it comes from. So if diesel prices rise 10% year over year, electricity will rise 10% year over year. But what you actually pay for electricity depends heavily on who you are, where you are, what time you're using the electricity, and that sort of thing. Uh, commercial facilities, warehouses, 
actually pay a much lower rate for electricity than you do at your home, for instance. And I think you at home pay less than uh, commercial facilities downtown. Uh, we in Oregon pay less than some other places in the country and much more than other places in the country and as well. So there's the, the electricity. The good thing about it, though, the vehicle's so efficient that electricity really, electricity cost really isn't that important into, as far as how much the vehicle will cost over the lifetime, unless it just skyrockets. Um, but y even assuming you know, 15, 20% or very high year-over-year -year inflation rates really doesn't make that much difference, not nearly as much as the diesel truck, which is much more sensitive owing to its lower efficiency to fuel prices. Yeah. Um, I was wondering how you could account for like uh, really high fluctuations in um, demand weights throughout a truck's route, or do you just assume it's always the maximum weight that it would carry? I what I assume is that all customers demand the same thing, which is fairly simplistic. But again, it's to sort of keep this to the point where I can get the paper out in two years and you still graduate. <laughs> You know, there's, in fact, that's another thing, too, is time windows. You know, I assume that you could serve all customers in any order, but that's kind of a very specific application of, of this sort of model that, you know, in real life just isn't true that often. So uh, that's, that's another good point, and, and my answer to that would be, unfortunately, there, there are some things that we just have to assume, well, maybe not unfortunately, but... For simplicity, we just have to make some assumptions that in the real world probably won't hold true. But the important thing is that the framework we developed could be applied to that. If you come to me and say, I have this set of customers in these locations that need to be served in this order and need this much stuff, uh, using the same, the same framework we developed there, then you could easily answer that question. But in terms of just looking at the scenarios in which the electric trucks are better, the conventional trucks better, I made very simplistic assumptions. Everybody wants the same thing at the same time, and they're all equally far apart from each other, that sort of thing. Yes, sir. Um, can you speak some as to what the uh, the maintenance costs that you were looking at were? Yeah, the um, I actually found a number of good sources for that, which is good because fleet managers know pretty well what diesel costs or the maintenance costs for diesel engines are. It's about 20 cents a mile and electric vehicles are now around enough and it's fairly easy to forecast that. So we assume that those are 10 cents a mile. Um, why do you suppose the electrical or the electric truck costs are much lower per mile? less moving parts really there's no transmission there's no oil uh, it's just a simpler a simpler sort of the power delivery mechanism so that's one thing you know I talked about some of the drawbacks of battery power which is it's really heavy and it's really expensive but that's one of the good things about it is an electric motor is just simpler and has less moving parts than a conventional motor Thank you, Ryan. Thanks. Thank you to all three, and next week we'll continue with more TRB papers. Thanks.